into our online service here at Shankle Baptist. I'm Gail Morrison and we're really glad you've joined us today. So if you have any needs for prayer, please contact us on the number below. We're having communion at the end of the service and if you would like to join in with that, just take time to prepare for that at the end of the service. If you've enjoyed our service this morning and you've been blessed, please share it on social media and subscribe so that you can get updates of the meetings. Thank you. Let's step inside. Good morning and welcome to morning worship in Shankill Baptist Church in Tennant Street, Belfast. We do welcome you in our Saviour's name and we're delighted that you're joining with us in our morning worship. So wherever you are and wherever you're listening, we trust and pray that this service may be a, a source of blessing to you. Just one or two brief but necessary Announcements, our service concludes with the remembrance of the Lord and the breaking of bread. And if you know and love the Saviour, your Saviour invites you and instructs you to remember him in this, his own appointed way. Our Sunday school and Bible class this afternoon at half past three. And then our evening service at seven o'clock. That service is preceded by a season of prayer at half past six. And then our service at 7. And we would love you to join us and be part of our evening congregation here in Shankill Baptist. Why not come along and be in God's house and know the blessing of fellowship with God's people. Our service is at 7 o'clock. And then on Tuesday night, it is the men's fellowship. Men, keep that evening in mind at half past 7 and Paul Somerville from Zazra will be the special guest on that evening. It's a great night, great night for men. And so men, come along on Tuesday night at half past seven. Our church night on Wednesday night at half seven when we meet for praise and for the study of God's word and for prayer. A very important meeting in the life of our church here in Shankill. Brian Higginson, one of our church members, We'll be bringing the word on Wednesday evening. And then the service is next Lord's Day, 11 in the morning and 7 in the evening. And we look forward to welcoming you to these services. All these announcements are made subject to the sovereign will of God. Let's worship God this morning. Let's hear his word. The psalmist writes in Psalm 84, how lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of hosts. My soul longs, yes, faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and flesh sing for joy to the living God. Even the sparrow finds a home, and the swallow a nest for herself, where she may lay her young at your altars. O Lord of hosts, my King and my God, Blessed are those who dwell in your house, ever singing your praise. We thank God for his word. And with these words in mind, let's worship God as we praise him, singing these lovely words, How lovely is thy dwelling place. Oh, 
Let's unite our hearts together in prayer. Let us all pray. Our God and our Father, we are gathered here this morning in the name of your beloved Son, the Lord Jesus. We come to you with our heads bowed and we lift our hearts and offer you our praise and worship. And as we seek to draw near, we acknowledge our utter dependence upon your grace. We bow in your holy presence on no other merit other than the merit of the Lord Jesus and his atoning sacrifice for our sins. We pray that you will help us to truly worship you today. Give us eyes to see the Lord high and lifted up. Help us to recognize and realize that he is in the midst according to his promise. Open our eyes again to see and move our hearts to sense your greatness. Open our hearts to receive from you what is best for these lives of ours. We pray that you will deepen our faith, that you will quicken our spirits, that you will revive our hearts at this time. And may our praise and worship come before your throne and be unto you as a sweet-smelling savour holy and acceptable in your sight. We are glad this morning to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord and to enthrone him and you in our hearts and in our lives. We come before you in humility, in awe, in wonder, in faith, in hope, in love, in worship. We recognize without hesitation your power, your authority, your love and wisdom, your faithfulness and your goodness. Great and wonderful God, we come to you now in the name of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. And we pray that you'll receive the worship we offer to you this day. 
O God in heaven, in your mercy, hear our prayer for Jesus' sake. Amen. As we survey the scriptures, as we relate to the experiences of life, all of us this morning can sing about the faithfulness of God. That's the hymn that we sing now as we continue to focus our attention on God. Great is thy faithfulness. to worship God as we come to him in our intercessory prayer. Let's all pray. Our Father and our God, we continue to worship you as we bow in the attitude of prayer before your throne of grace. We pray that you will help us never to forget how much we are loved and what it cost you to, to accomplish so great a salvation. We pray that you will help us to live our lives under the shadow of the cross to spend and be spent for your eternal glory. We come to, for, to confess our sin. 
We come to pray for forgiveness for all our sin. We cannot hide them from you. You are the eternal God, the one who sees and knows all things. Your word reminds us that light and darkness are alike to you. You know what is wicked and evil and what is so grieving to you, and yet you love us and invite us to come to the throne of grace where we are promised mercy and grace to help us in all our times of need. Forgive us if we are ever tempted to think lightly of sin. Forgive us for our foolish ways, for hurtful words, for that pride that can be so self-seeking and hurtful even to our nearest and dearest, and above all to God himself. Cleanse us afresh this morning. And enable us by your grace to be what you want us to be, to do what you want us to do, to go where you want us to go. Forgive us for making vain excuses, for following our own plans, for fulfilling our own agenda, while all the time you are calling us to seek first your kingdom. Help us to believe and to live in such a way that we're convinced that as for God, his way is perfect. We pray for the needs of others this morning. Those within our church family and Shankill who are led aside. We thank you for those who are present this morning and your hand has been upon them. And we thank you for recovery and health and strength. We remember this morning those who at times feel the journey of life to be tough and testing and trying. Those who who are listening to our service and those who are present here this morning and they're wrestling with things that trouble their hearts and their minds. Things that sometimes from where they're standing are hard to understand. Help us all to see that in your love you know what is best. In your wisdom you plan what is best. And in your sovereignty you bring about what is best. We take time to pray for our world, a world that is so unstable, so uncertain. We pray this morning for all who are in need, for those whose lives are wrecked and ruined by sin, for those who are abused in so many ways because of the wickedness and evil of human hearts. We think of different parts of the world this morning where there are great needs, famine, pestilence, deprivation, children starving for want of food and shelter, for the innocent victims of evil political systems that are so violent and destructive. Lord, we pray again for our nation, for our province, for a world that continually turns its back on God, sets aside the word of God and worships other gods and follows a way that is contrary to the ways of the Almighty. Have mercy upon us, O God. We pray for our leaders. May they have that humbleness of spirit that will cause them to acknowledge their need of God and their utter dependence upon the God in whom we live and move and have our being. Hear our prayer. Receive our praise and our thanks for all your kindness, for all your goodness. We're so glad that we're able to come to the one who is over all. The one who is able to do more than we can ask or even think. And as we bring our prayer and petition and supplication to you this morning, we also acknowledge your kindness in all the many gifts that you have lavished upon us. We realize that we can never outgive the Lord, but we give you the gladness of our hearts. We give you our praise. We give you our thanks. Hear our prayer. We pray all these things in the mighty name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. Great and wonderful are the names given to the Lord Jesus and Holy Scripture. None more precious and meaningful than the name Shepherd. He is the shepherd of his people. And we sing that lovely psalm, The Lord's My Shepherd, to a a modern uh, 
translation of the hymn, The Lord's my shepherd, I'll not want. It reminds us in the refrain that we can trust him at all times and under every circumstance. So let's praise God as we worship him in the singing of The Lord's my shepherd. The Lord's my shepherd, I'll not want. He makes me lie in pastures green. He leads me by the still, still waters. His goodness restores my soul. invite you to open your Bible at 1 Kings chapter 19, 1 Kings chapter 19 as we continue in our present series of studies and our morning services entitled A Man for Our Times, Elijah, A Man for Our Times. We're going to read from 1 Kings 19 verses 9 through to 18 and this is the word of the Lord. Speaking of Elijah, we read, There he came to a cave and lodged in it. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, and he said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? And he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts. For the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. And I, even I only, am left, and they seek my life to take it away. And he said, Go out and stand on the mount before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by, and a great strong wind tore the mountains and broke in pieces the rocks before the Lord, and the Lord was not in the wind. 
And death to the wind and earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And death to the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And death to the fire, the sound of a low whisper. And when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his cloak and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. Behold, there came a voice to him and said, What are you doing here, Elijah? And he said, I've been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. And I, even I only am left, and they seek my life to take it away. And the Lord said to him, Go, return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus, and when you arrive, you shall anoint Hazael to be king over Syria, and Jehu the son of Nimshah you shall anoint to be king over Israel, and Elisha the son of Shaphat of abel you shall anoint to be prophet in your place. And the one who escapes from the sword of Hazael shall Jehu put to death. And the one who escapes from the sword of Jehu shall Elisha put to death. Yet I will leave 7,000 in Israel, all the knees that have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. This is the word of the Lord, and we give thanks to God for his precious word of truth. If you have been following our series of studies, in the life and times of Elijah, you will have noted that the striking lesson that comes to the fore again and again is a very simple one and a very obvious one. Elijah was a man of like passion as we are. He was just a very ordinary man who experienced all the problems and perplexities of life the same as we do. And to understand this is to grasp the significance of this 19th chapter in the first book of Kings. We note that at the beginning of the chapter we have the picture of a very human situation. The prophet is at wit's end corner. He is despondent, he is depressed. And after he was ministered to by an angel of the Lord, the Bible tells us in verse 8 that he arose and ate and he drank. And he went in the strength of that food 40 days and 40 nights. He went to a place called Horeb, the Mount of God. That's where we want to go this morning. And at Horeb, Elijah learned some very precious and powerful lessons. And we want to try and learn the lessons that God was teaching Elijah. Will you notice with me this morning three things as we stay with the prophet at Mount Horeb? Will you note, first of all, the vision that he saw? The vision that he saw. At this particular time, the prophet hadn't recovered from his despondent state. And when he came to Horeb and lodged in the cave, God put a very searching question before him. What are you doing here, Elijah? What are you doing here, Elijah? And let me say this right away. Here was a question that was designed not for God's benefit, but rather for Elijah's benefit. It was meant to be an appeal to the man's conscience for an actual fact. Being in this cave meant that he was out of the will of God. You see, he had received no divine directive, as had been the case in relation to Cherith, the brook Cherith, and Zarephath, where he encountered the widow woman. He had gone to both these places at the command of God. But his presence at Mount Harab was a different manner, for God had not instructed him to go there. He was there because of the threat received from Jezebel against his life. And God is about to teach him a very necessary lesson at this point in his life. He was about to give him a vision that he would never forget. We've read about that vision in these two verses. In verse 11 and verse 12. And this vision was meant to impress upon the prophet 
the greatness of God's power. You see, Elijah's heart had failed him because of Jezebel. But he was going to learn that God was greater than all. And nothing impresses man more forcibly as to the power that can control nature. You can recall how the disciples had seen Jesus perform miracle, many miracles. But it was only after he had stilled the storm and the raging waves and the wind on the sea of Galilee that they responded by saying this, What manner of man is this, that even the winds and the waves obey him? They had seen the Lord feed a great multitude of people with a mere five loaves and two small fish. But it was only after he had walked in the waves and stilled the storm that they were really amazed with the power that he had exercised. And yet they should not have been amazed because all power was his. But just as the disciples were impressed by the power of the Lord, so also was the prophet. He was equally impressed with such power. And we might ask the question, why did he need to be impressed by the power of God? Did he not know it already? Had he not drawn on that power in unusual ways many times before? Withholding the rain, raising the dead, calling the fire. And the answer to those questions is yes. All this is true. But somehow or other, the reality of that power had become dim in his memory because of the threat of this wicked woman Jezebel. He had run away as if God hadn't the power to protect him. Was there a power failure in heaven? It seemed like that in Elijah's thinking. And in his cold, self-justifying condition in the wilderness, there had been no return of the reality of God's power. And for this reason, there was need for renewal. And so God speaks to him in the 11th verse of 1 Kings 19. And he says, Go out and stand on the mount of the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by in a great strong wind tore the mountains and broke in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind and after the wind and earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. Go out and stand on the mountain. How would you and I to respond to such a command? You see, too many of us can be in prison by ourselves in our own thoughts, living in our own little world. Maybe what we need this morning is a new vision of the Lord. We need to come out of our self-made caves and stand before the Lord as Elijah did here on Mount Horeb. The scripture tells us that the Lord passed by. And Elijah remained all the time in the cave and during the time of this great storm and earthquake and fire. But so far as Elijah was concerned, in spite of these manifestations of God's power, the Lord was not in it. You see, I think God was saying to Elijah, you need not have run away, for this is how powerful I am. I can protect you. I can preserve you no matter what Jezebel may have tried to do. Here was a man in a cave of his own making because he failed to focus his attention on God's power. Can we not fail here as well? Do you and I not need to continually remind ourselves of the greatness of God's power? That is greater than all our problems and greater than all our fears. That is, he is as great today as he was in the days of Elijah. Here's a question that I want to ask you this morning. How big is your God? How big is your God? Listen to these lines. You maybe have heard them in song before, but let me read them to you. Uh, the uh, songwriter puts it like this. Though man may strive 
to go beyond the reef of space, to crawl beyond the distant glimmering stars. This world's a room so small within my master's hand, the open sky but a portion of his yard. How big is God? How big and wide his vast domain? To try to tell these lips can only start. He's big enough to rule the mighty universe, yet small enough to live within my heart. How big is your God? The vision he saw. Note secondly the voice that he heard. We read in verse 12 that after the fire there was a still small voice. The prophet had been disappointed. The prophet had been distressed ever since the mighty victory of Mount Carmel. Perhaps in his own thinking he had expected things in Israel to change overnight. But instead he received that threat which drove him away from God. And over and over again he repeats these words that we have read this morning. I have been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the people of Israel. Have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, killed your prophets with the sword. And I, even I only am left. And they seek to take away my life. God is speaking to him in a still, small voice. A still, small voice destined by the Almighty to calm and to soothe his ruffled spirit. And to assure him that in every circumstance of life, in every situation of life, his God was with him. Perhaps God may have been saying, fear not Elijah, I am with you. I would think that if the vision was to assure him of the power of God, the voice was to assure him of the presence of God. Verse 13 tells us that when Elijah heard that voice, he wrapped his face in his mantle. And he went outside before he had been mourning about all the failure of his efforts. But now things were beginning to change. And how often we need to hear that still small voice. That still small voice as we try to contend with the circumstances of life that can be so changeable. How life can change for any of us so quickly. And how often we need to be assured of God's presence with us as we make our journey through this waste howdy wilderness of life. The way can be dark. The way can be dreary at times. But what a difference when we are conscious of God's presence. What a difference the conscious sense of God's presence makes to us. In the midst of the battle, in the midst of the storm, to hear him speak in a still, small voice, I will never leave you, and I will never, never forsake you. Do you remember how Dr. Luke puts it as he recalls uh, an experience of Paul in the storm in Acts 27? God speaks to his servant, and he says, And now... I urge you to take heart, for there will be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. For there stood by me this night an angel of God to whom I belong and whom I serve, saying, Do not be afraid, Paul. You must be brought before Caesar. Indeed, God has granted you and all those who sail with you. Therefore, take heart. Man, for I believe God that it will be just as it was told me. An old writer put it like this. You can never starve a man who's feeding on the promises of God. You can never starve a man who is feeding on the promises of God. Have you ever sung those words, standing on the promises of Christ my King? Are you standing on the promises this morning? 
Are you feeding on the promises of this, mor this morning? Well, if we feed on the promise of God, we will never be starved. You know, there are a, a number of fear nots scattered throughout the, Bi throughout the Bible. I heard someone say the other day in radio that there are 365 fear nots in the Bible. And if that is true, there is one for every day. Every day, Jesus says to you, fear not. How we need to emulate Abraham at this point. Paul reflects upon Abraham's experience as he writes to the saints at Rome. In Romans chapter 4, he says, Concerning Abraham, he did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God. Being fully convinced, being fully persuaded, being absolutely sure beyond any shadow of doubt that what God had promised, he also was able to perform. Many years ago, the captain of a large vessel set sail with his family from Liverpool. They were heading for the great city in USA, New York. And when the, one night when everyone in the boat was asleep, a great storm blew up. The wind came sweeping over the water that struck the vessel and almost capsized it. Everything movable was sent tumbling and crashing. And it wasn't long before the passengers realized that they were in imminent danger. The captain's little daughter, just eight years old, was awakened by all the commotion. And she cried out with fright, What's all the noise? What's happening? And when she was told about the storm, she replied, Is my father on the bridge? And someone assured her that he was. And then she dropped back into her pillow and she soon fell asleep. The reality of her father's presence made all the difference. It was Thomas Kelly who said this, Never get frantic when God is at the helm of your life. Never get frantic when God is at the helm of your life. There was the vision he saw. There was the voice that he heard. There was the vocation that he received. Notice what we read in verse 15. Go, return. Go, return. Elijah ran away from his appointed place of service. He had left his post and disappeared to a, a solitary place. He had stepped out of the will of God to avoid this threat on his life. And now here we have God recommission him. He was sending him back to do three things. First of all, to anoint Hazael to be king over Syria. This particular king was to be a rod of chastisement in the land of Israel. Hazael was like a tornado wherever he went. He represented the storm and the destruction of the fierce winds which the prophet saw in the vision. This was to be God's answer to Elijah's complaint regarding Israel's backsliding and apostasy. God would act in judgment against his own. And when the prophet eventually met Hazael, he wept bitterly and when asked why, he replied, Because I know the evil that you will do to Israel. You know, we are reminded this morning it's a fearful thing when we sin against God. For he is not indifferent to our continual sinning. And he will move in judgment if we do not repent of our sin and forsake our sin. And the world in which we live and the inhabitants of a world that rejects Christ is a world that is facing God's judgment. Elijah was to appoint Hazael to be king over Syria. He was also to anoint Jehu to be king over Israel. This particular king was to bring judgment against the whole house of Ahab. He proved to be like an earthquake, shaking 
the house of King Ahab from within. Jezebel, the vicious queen, was thrown from a window and dogs ate her body. Baal worship was rooted out and the land, generally speaking, was cleaned up with the removal of false priests. This was God's answer to Elijah's complaint concerning the worship of Baal and the wicked house of Baal. You see, God just doesn't act against sin in the lives of his own people, but he acts against sin in the lives of his enemy. God is not indifferent to sin wherever it is found. We see that in God's calling to Elijah here to appoint Hazael to be keen over Syria and Jehu to be keen over Israel and then to anoint Elisha as the prophet in the place of Elijah. Elijah's work was not yet finished, but God had already chosen another to be his successor. Elijah would slay the enemies of God's people, and of course he would also bring comfort to God's people. This was the answer of God to Elijah's complaint that no one was left in the land as a prophet of Jehovah. But Elijah was going to learn that God would never leave himself without a witness. For the torch that Elijah had lit would continue to burn through his servant Elisha. And even to this very day, God has seen fit to continue his witness among men. In time past, he spoke to the fathers through the prophets. But as we read in Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 1, in these last days, he has spoken to us through his son. And the real point to grasp in these instructions given to Elijah by God was that he was showing him the purpose of God in his life at this time. He was showing Elijah that he was a vital link in the divine chain that will fulfill the plan and purpose of God. And how important It is for you and me to appreciate and to assimilate that God has a plan and a purpose for all our lives. I wonder this morning, are you and I yielded to the Lord to such a degree that your life and my life is at his disposal in order that his plan and purposes may be fulfilled in us and through us? Here I am, we sometimes sing, wholly available. As for me, I will serve the Lord. There's a work for you to do this morning. There's a service for you to render this morning. Some little task, even a cup of water given in the Lord's name will have its reward. And there's not one here today who cannot give a cup of water in the Lord's name. There's some little task for you to do. Have you ever thought of coming to the leadership of the church and said, is there anything that I can do by way of service for the master within the life and community of the church here? And you may discover to your surprise and to your delight and to your blessing that there is something that you can do. As we close this morning, Elijah's experience on Mount Horeb taught him fresh lessons about God's power and God's presence. And God's purpose. And it was only after he came to a new understanding of the power of God and the presence of God that he again became useful in the service of God. This encounter with God, this experience of God and Mount Horeb made all the difference. But you know, like the prophet, we too have proved God's power. We too have proved God's presence not once or twice but on many occasions and you and I know from personal experience that God is that he always was and he always shall be and that he desires you and I to be willing servants serving him with a loyal and a true devotion A service that flows from hearts that are worshipping. Remember God's directive to his ancient people 
And it comes again to you and me this morning. You shall worship the Lord your God and him only you will serve. What is our response? I will serve him because I love him. The vacation, the, the vision he saw, the voice he heard, the vocation he received. Oh, use me, Lord. Use even me, just as thou wilt and when and where, until thy blessed face I see, thy rest, thy joy, thy glory share. May the Lord bless his word to all our hearts this morning. We give him thanks for it. Let's pray together. In a moment or two, we're going to be coming to the Lord's table to remember the Lord. And if you're saved by his grace and walking in fellowship with him, he invites you, he instructs you to remember him in the breaking of bread. Father, we thank you this morning for your word. We thank you for these things that are recorded in Holy Scripture for our good. And as we have tried to unpack the meaning of your servant's experience with the living God on this mount, May it be our experience today to see you more clearly, to love you more dearly, and to follow you more nearly. And as we come to this table this morning of remembrance, we pray that we will be mindful of the Lord Jesus Christ, who was willing to serve his Father even unto death the death of the cross. Bless us as we continue to worship you now. In Jesus' name. Amen. The prophet Jeremiah was known as the weeping prophet. And he has a book that identifies that. It is called Lamentations. And in Lamentations chapter 1 and verse 12, we read these words. Is it nothing to you All you who pass by, look and see if there is any sorrow like my sorrow, which was brought upon me, which the Lord inflicted on the day of his fierce anger. Now, of course, these words, so far as Jeremiah was concerned, had a personal application. But they also have a prophetical application. Because they point us to Calvary and to the cross. And they teach us three things about the cross. First of all, they teach us about the day of the cross. Jeremiah speaks here of the day of his fierce anger. Of all the days in the history of time, there was no day like the day of the cross. The fierce anger of Almighty God never burned upon this earth as it burned in concentrated form on that terrible day. The object of that wrath, that inescapable anger of God, was the spotless, sinless, soilless, stainless, flawless, harmless Son of God and Son of Man. Why? Well, let the inspired Prophet Isaiah gave the answer. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And Christ drank the cup of wrath as the substitute for sinners, the slaughtered Lamb of God, taken away the sin of the world. The day of the cross the day of his fierce anger but then these words remind us not only of the day of the cross but the desolation of the cross look and see if there was any sorrow like my sorrow all of us have experienced sorrow many of us 
read about it, hear about it, and watch it on our screens every day. I remember in my first church visiting a home, and in that home was a little boy who loved me to read from his storybook. And in that storybook there was a page where the naughty sheep had to leave home. And every time we got to that page, he started to cry. And no matter how often I, I called, he handed me the book to read. And every time we came to that particular page, he cried. His tears were real tears. They were sad. They were sorrowful tears. It was the sorrow of a child. I have stood at an open grave and witnessed big grown men seeing their chest heave and tears flow down their pale cheeks as the remains of a loved one was led to rest in Mother Earth. And theirs was a deeper kind of sorrow, the sorrow not of a child but the sorrow of a man. But today in these moments we look at the man of Calvary crowned with thorns and crying as the tears coursed down his cheeks. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That was the deepest sorrow of all, the sorrow of God. Look and see if there was any sorrow like my sorrow, the day of the cross, the day of his fierce anger, the desolation of the cross. Look and see if there is any sorrow like my sorrow, the demands of the cross. Is it nothing to you or you? that pass by. Every one of us is on a journey. Every man, every woman is on a journey, a pilgrim on the journey of life. And we pass by many places. We observe many scenes and sights and hear many sounds as we pursue that journey. The question that has been asked this morning is the suffering of God nothing to you? Is the meaning of that sorrow and suffering and sacrifice and shame nothing to you? What response will you make to the demands of the cross? Will you be indifferent? Surely, we must say this this morning, that if a man or a woman, a young person or a boy or a girl has been to Calvary, they will never be the same again. I came across these words some time ago. Let me Read them before we sing our hymn. When Jesus came to Belfast, they simply passed him by. They never heard a hair of him. They simply let him die. For men had grown more tender, and they would not give him pain. They only passed down the street and left him in the rain. There is nothing more hurtful to the heart of God than the indifference to his love, to his mercy, to his grace at the place called Calvary. As we remember this morning the Lord Jesus, let's consider the day of the cross, the destruction of the cross, and the demand of the cross. Is it nothing to you, all you who pass by, Look and see if there was any sorrow like my sorrow, which was brought upon me, which the Lord inflicted on the day of his fierce anger. As we come to break bread this morning, let's sing these lovely words. There is a Redeemer.
as we continue to remember our Redeemer and think about the redemption that he has purchased for us, let us bow and give thanks for the bread and for the wine that we're about to partake of. Let's pray. Father, we thank you this morning for the cross. We thank you for the Christ of the cross and all that he suffered in our place when he died yonder on Calvary's tree. We thank you this morning for the redemption that we have found in him. We're at peace with God because of the sacrifice of our Savior. Now as we are about to partake of this bread and drink of this cup, we remember again with grateful hearts that he took our sins and our sorrows and he made them his very own. And he bore the burden to Calvary and he suffered and he died alone. He shed his precious blood that our sins might be forgiven. Receive our thanks. Receive our praise. Receive our worship. In Jesus' name. Amen. The same night in which the Lord Jesus Christ was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he prayed and he said, Take eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner also he took the cup, saying, Here was the new covenant in his blood. And we know that as often as we eat of this bread and drink of this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Our God and our Father, as we come to the close of our worship this morning, we thank you for your presence with us. We thank you for these lovely hymns that we have been singing to praise and to worship and to magnify the name of our God. We thank you for the instruction that we have received from your word. and We pray, O oh God, that you will enable us by your spirit to live it out in our lives day by day. And for the sweet remembrance of our Saviour, in the breaking of bread, we thank you. We praise you this morning that he who died and was buried rose again. And he lives in the power of an endless life. And because he lives, we shall live also. We ask that you will part us in your fear and with your blessing. And watch over us till we meet again. For Jesus' sake. Amen. I thank you for listening this morning. We trust and pray that our service has been a blessing to you. And we invite you again to our evening service at 7 o'clock. Why not come along and be part of our evening congregation here in Shankill Baptist Church. We can assure you of a warm welcome and you will be blessed as you meet with us. We trust and pray that you will have a very blessed day and a blessed week. And know the hand of the Lord upon you and upon all whom you love. We thank you. God bless you. Mm -hmm.